There you go, so you didn't need the microphone. The microphone is necessary not because we want the sound amplifier, but rather for the webcasting, which is being done, in case you didn't know. Um, so my, my name is, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hossein Sadiqpur, I'm here at ICAM, and uh, if there are things that you need or questions you have, you can ask me, you can ask Jim, and also Naomi and Alice, who are, uh, who I'm sure, will be in contact with you. So let's start this session. I think the, the format for the talks are roughly 30 minutes. It's a sort of a soft 30 minutes. Okay. Um, but 10 minutes for question and answer. So with that, I yield the floor to uh, Peter Schnauzer from, um, from, from Hamburg. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Mm -hmm. Particularly, many thanks to the organizers, uh, to Svetlana and Tomaso for putting together this workshop. It's well, it's very nice to come to ITEMP and experience the exciting atmosphere over here in doing research, but now with a particular challenge, as Tomaso indicated in a very inspiring way, also to go forward and make the links to more applied science, potential applications in credit technology at least, and the road to potential applications. So we back in Hamburg, we are working on these atom ion hybrid systems since a few years already, and. Uh, and looking in particular also in this combination of ultra cold environment where you have neutral atoms combined, both of the species usually being trapped with ions. Now, so far, this is mostly a single ion and a uh, number of atoms, and the number of atoms range from two to several hundred, bridging across over from few to many body systems, according to our technology. So, um, this is the place, this is the Center for Optical Quantum Technologies back in Hamburg. So this is uh, mostly experimental facilities, lab, but then there's a theory floor, and there's the offices of the experimentalists. And we also do have a small, not like item over here, but we do have a small workshop program and occasionally some workshops on relevant uh, topics. Uh, you have heard about that there was also one hybrid atom workshop uh, back in 2015. And, uh, and we do have a, a guest program, so you are more than welcome if you want to visit. And, and, and experience a little bit of the Hamburg environment. And this is my theory group uh, currently. So um, now I'm talking about a work, uh, theoretical work, which has been done in collaboration with Johann Schur, that's a PhD student who is currently finishing up uh, back in Hamburg, and of course of Antonio Negretti, who is in the audience. He will go to give a talk today afternoon, uh, and myself. And then there is an ongoing experiment within the excellence cluster of the Federal uh, the German Science Foundation of the federal government of Germany, there is an experiment where people shoot with ultra-fast lasers on PECs and ionize neutral atoms, and then there's ions. They are quite energetic in the mini electrovolt regime. And, and this is currently being built up, also uh, being supplied also with an ion detector at the moment. So there, uh, later on, there is a visit to a collaboration between theory experiments once all of that is set up completely. So, um, the contents of my talk, um, after a brief motivation, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ion, atom ion setup. Yeah? Not a lot about collisions so much, but of course they are a key ingredient to what I'm talking about. Uh, but in particular how we model the interactions, because this will be few to many body physics. After all, so we need a nice modeling for the uh, uh, methodology we're using, a nice modeling of the atom ion setup, atom ion interaction in particular here. Then I will very briefly talk about uh, the method, the many body method we are using to do dynamics. And part of this talk will be about dynamics. Part of this presentation will be about stationary state properties, ground state excitations, and so forth. All of that is done within this uh, method, which is this ugly acronym, MLMCDDHP, which stands for multi-layer, multi-configuration, time-dependent partial for bosons. So yeah, just. MLMTDHP, that's it. Yeah, don't, you don't need to worry about the details. So I will be very brief on that one. And then I have three following subsections, and, and, and they uh, go with increasing complexity uh, in the following sense. Yeah. First, I talk about an ion that is immersed into ultra cold atoms, but its position is fixed. It has no motion of degree of freedom. It's fixed in there. As such, it creates an additional potential. And you ask about what is the ground state properties and how can we probe these ground state properties in a concrete setup. Then we move from state properties to dynamics. That means in this subsection four, I will talk about the fact you have the ground state of the system, neutral atoms. 
you suddenly, like for example using a laser pulse, create an ion and you induce dynamics. This is what I call here capture dynamics of an impurity ion. But still, that uh, means the ion is still fixed. You create it and you look into the dynamics uh, of the atoms by being exposed to this uh, extra interaction potential between the charge and the neutral atoms. And then, and this makes it even more complex, we include the motion degree of freedom of the ion on a quantum level. We assume the, ions are, the ion is trapped, and we look into particular, and this is uh, a reminiscent of the title of this presentation, or the mesoscopic molecular ions, because neutrons can be bound to the ions, make effectively in a quasi-particle picture the ion heavier, and you can ask about the response of such a system and the structure in particular of such a system. And then there will be very few concluding remarks. Okay, motivation. I think atom ion hybrid systems have their own versatility within this large landscape of ultra cold systems and their own challenges in particular. Yeah? I mean, you can go from the really microscopic questions of collisions or reactions down to the road of many body systems and, and uh, uh, really constructing atom ion hybrid systems and their unique properties. So you could think about controlled state dependent atom ion scattering. I mean, one example was given by uh, Tommaso, and uh, this was this ion controlled Boses and Chosis junction depending on the ion state. Now you could think about microscopic ultra cold chemical reactions and maybe charge transform in collisions. Yeah? Then this is uh, what I said, novel tunneling and state-dependent transport processes. Of course, depending on the spin state, hyperfine state, the interactions vary potentially, which is an interesting aspect on its own. And then, and this is a really a very incomplete list of what is all possible, this is just for a motivation. You could think about emulating condensed metaphysics, but now on a slightly different scale, not only a different scale, but including in particular also phonons, because in the usual optical lattice experiments with ultra-cold atoms, there's no back action on the optical lattice, of course. You just have the ultra-cold atoms, which is complicated enough, particularly in the strongly interacting regime, but there's no back action on the optical lattice. If you think about putting ions that are maybe trapped on their own, if you're putting ions into this soup or sea of cold atoms, of course the ions can take a feedback. So you can have phonons in this system, and you know very well from condensed matter physics that this opens a plethora of novel phenomena. You can have charged phonon couplings, you can have polarons, whatever um, uh, your heart desires. Then, and this is more in the direction this talk will be going, there is of course the fact that your neutral atoms can be captured into bound states by the ions. And that way you can form something like a mesoscopic molecular ion, which is large size, which can bind many neutrons and so forth. So this is more along the road I'm going to be talking about. So the atom ion setup. Okay. So of course, characteristic of the atom ion interaction is that induced polarizability. And the reaction due to the induced polarizability, that defines a length scale on its own, which relates to the C4 coefficient, of course, the polarizability coefficient um, of the interaction. So that is an extra scale which is in the system which makes the system more richer. Of course, there's a zero energy limit, but this zero energy limit is first of all not really experimentally being measured very carefully. Second, uh, it is of course also that this extra scale really has to be incorporated in the modeling and the interaction. Now, if you do that, uh, one ingredient which is extremely helpful is, of course, quantum defect theory, because quantum defect theory links the parameters of the asymptotic scattering, the phase shift, actually to the quantum defects themselves. And you have to ensure if you do something, meant on the theory side, if you model something, then you get a nice variability of the quantum defect parameters with respect to the scattering lengths. This is shown over here, and you see this for different energies, and you see that there's really a nice tunability uh, of the connection between quantum defect parameter and scattering length. Okay, so for our methodology, which tries to use two, five, 10, 20, 100 atoms in the course of the uh, investigation of our systems, we need something which is well suited for this methodology in terms of modeling the atom ion interaction. The one we set to the four, of course, is fine, but of course it's highly singular at short distances, and it's also not the physics which is happening in the system. So what we finally chose is of that form. It has 
in for the short distances a Gaussian. Yeah, V naught is positive, so it's a repulsive Gaussian. And it is attractive in the tail with 1 over z to the 4, where the 1 over omega and omega is a constant, can be neglected. And it mediates between the two. So it, in essence, it reproduces the long-range tail, 1 over z to 4, which makes the new physics. And the bound states will be essentially living in this tail. It regularizes the, the uh, diversions at the origin, of course, to the Gaussian. And it allows, and this is important, a nice connection between inner part quantum defect parameters and between the scattering phases. Now, this is a pick of the potentials you see here. Uh, so for different omegas, for this regularization parameter, different shapes. Here's the 1 over r to the force. Then you see here in the combined potential the uh, part which is giving you the attractive bound state and the repulsive Gaussians, and that varies, of course, on this parameter. The nice thing is, and this is shown in these two pictures, you vary gamma, gamma is here in the exponent, you vary omega, this is over here in the regularization of the volume of z to the 4, and what you see here, you vary with this uh, the quantum defect parameter, and therefore also the correspondingly the symptotic scattering phase shifts. Yeah? And you see here, this is a rather flat dependence, so with gamma there is little variation, in, with gamma variation, but there's a lot of variation in the vertical direction, which is omega, and complementary, this is varying for both gamma and omega. So you get some complementarity with varying the parameters, gamma and omega, in order to achieve whatever you want in terms of uh, random defect parameters, or finally phase shifts for the scattering, and that means you tune the interaction uh, the two-body interaction between the ion and the neutrons. Now, what is the methodology we are using in, to do all in, in the respect of what we're doing of all of the following, which means the computational approach uh, of ours. So this is, again, MLNCDDHP, just one slide. Okay, nothing more than one slide. So what is it about? You want to solve the original, actually the original idea comes from uh, quantum molecular dynamics from wave packet vibrational dynamics from molecules. It goes back to the beginning of the 90s to Uwe Mandel and Sederbaum and hans Dieter Meyer at theoretical chemistry in Heidelberg. It was used for distinguishable particle dynamics. Now here we have bosons, but we have also the ion, so we have indistinguishable and then one indistinguishable subsystems. And uh, what we're interested in is solutions of the many body time dependent Schrödinger equation, many body meaning, not just one, two, three, but more degrees of freedom that interact, and, and particularly for correlated quantum dynamics. So um, the, idea, the essential idea of this approach, there's a lot of technicalities and a lot of conceptual algorithmic things, but, but the key idea of the whole thing is that you use not just fixed orbitals and you expand your many-body wave function in a combination of these orbitals which are fixed in time, but uh, you use optimally moving bases in the many-body Hilbert space. That means with every time step in your propagation, in every step you're moving forward in time, you adapt your orbitals according to a variational principle such is that they are optimal. Yeah? So that could be, of course, the dirac Frankel, law, or it could be the McLaughlin variation principle which you use. And then, and this is about the ML that stands for multi-layer, that is, if you have, for example, different subsets of degrees of freedom, or if you have different species, which is automatically there, the one species being the ions, the other species being the neutral atoms, then you can divide your, uh, your uh, uh, approach into different layers. The one, the top layer, you call the species layer, the particle layer. What they show you here is the top layer is the constituting the total wave function in terms of superposition of different species many body wave functions. So you here, on this layer, you see the species entanglement, for example. Now here, on the species layer, which is the second uppermost layer, you spend your many body wave function of a certain species, which are mixed up on the top layer, into Fox states. Yeah, this is the superposition of many Fox states, where you sort in the different particles of the same species into those optimally chosen orbitals. And then there's a so-called particle layer where your orbitals, which come into your Fox space here, are expanded. You might want to call it in so-called primitive orbitals, which live then at the very lowest level on the grid. Okay, that's the idea. This, if you use this, plug it into the time-dependent equation, do some algebra, which is not a few lines, I can assure you, 
you get a system of coupled nonlinear partial integral differential equations, and those you solve. And then you go for it, and here you get the time dependent properties of the system, the responses in terms of dynamics. You can get also stationary states, and you're going to be using that, uh, and that is done via improved relaxation, imaginary time propagation. So, first step ground state of an immersed ion into uh, ultra cold atoms. So, I fix the ion. Okay, so what do I get? So I'm interested, I fix the ion, and I want to look onto the ground state properties. What you see here first is the density. The density is a function of the one coordinate. I'm talking about a one-dimensional system. So this is spatially one-dimensional. And what you see here is the density, and the density with increasing interaction strengths. First, this is g equal to zero, zero interaction strength. Uh, no, this is, sorry, this is for increasing particle number. And you see that with increasing particle number, of course, interactions become more and more important. And this is this sequence of particle numbers, 4, 30, 50, and 150. And first of all, you see that there is a notch at 0, z equal to 0, which is a density hole uh, caused by the ion. And then you see that a more and more a tail due to uh, the interaction among the neutral atoms develops with increasing uh, the particle number, where interactions become more and more important. This is the energetic contributions, uh, and actually the crosses here come from a type of Thomas Fermi modeling, and the solid curves come from the exact calculations from the improved relaxation. And what you see here is that, of course, the interaction energy, which is given here, increases, of course, and then first linearly and then nonlinearly has a certain scale in, in the asymptotic n to infinity limit accordingly the energy E of n, and then you see that the kinetic energy decreases with particle and becomes less important, as to be expected, and, and then the ion energy first raises linearly, which comes because sorting the bosons into the ion, also particularly ion bound states in some sense, yeah, and, but then it levels off, which comes from the broadening, and you can't put arbitrarily many particles uh, close to the ion. And this is a momentum spectrum. You see here that the momentum spectrum in the pure harmonic oscillator situation uh, without the ion is just uh, much uh, thinner and much less wide than the corresponding momentum distribution with the ion. And that has also a double hum structure. And these different curves simply come from increasing the particle numbers. So you see that with increasing particle number, the double hum structure somehow uh, vanishes. This is a short look onto expansion dynamics. So what we do is you have the fixed ion, then you suddenly switch off in the one dimension, you do switch off the trap and let the system expand. Okay? And what you expand here in this simulation is then the state which is just uh, obtained in the ground state. So what you see here, this is just the, just the uh, harmonic trap, nothing spectacular. Um, you see the expansion with time, the widening, and this is the single particle density. And what you see opposed to this, n equal 20, 50, and 100 particles, that in the case of the ion's presence, you have this interference pattern over here. And this comes, I showed you the density hole, and the different wings uh, where the particles are localized. This comes from these different wings, where the particles are ejected into, into one dimension, and they start to interfere. You can do that for even stronger interaction strengths. I will not, let's not walk through this one by one, just a brief mentioning, focus on that one. There's a difference between, now this is for smaller particle numbers, there's a difference between even and odd particles. You see here that the interference is not pronounced in the time of flight, whereas it is pronounced in the time of flight over here. And that comes from the fact that for odd particles, you have delocalized particles for very strong interactions, on top of localized particles in the single particle density, which makes up for coherence again, opposed to the only localized particles here, which reflects itself actually also in the coherences of the single particle density matrix or in the two-body density matrix. You see here, well, that's hardly possible. I'm sorry for that one. But there is a coherences, large, co significant coherences in the off diagonal present, where it is not here, where these correspond to the different particle numbers, n equal to 4, n equal to 5, and then also corresponding characteristic differences in the two body density matrix. OK, so this was the situation just trying to get a bit of a clue of what happens in the structure of the ground state once an ion is present. Now let's go one step further and let's take the neutral cloud 
and shine a laser on it and let's create suddenly an ion but of course the state of the deuteroposons is not the ground state it's the ground state without the presence of the ion and then we are interested in the dynamics so just give you a picture in terms of single particle physics um, we have that ionic part, the two wings, the attractive part, the tail of the 1 over r to the 4, and what you see is that there is some uh, inner part states, inner states, which of course you might want to call bound states yet, but an inner part of the states, and then there is the, atom, the trapped states, yeah? these upper states here, which are kind of split uh, uh, according to the presence of the core uh, of the atom-ion interaction. Uh, and these are qualitatively different states. The, the ones are you know, bar, you know, trapped, and, and the other ones are the trapped states. So we expect that something happens in the course of the dynamics between these qualitatively different types of states. Okay, let's look at that. This is a single particle density as a function of time. This is the one coordinate, Z, and what you see is that immediately after you switch on the presence of the ion, what happens is that the essential part of the amplitude is sucked into the inner part, yeah, into this inner part, into this kind of occupation of single particle states. Now, but following up on that, there's a rich non-equilibrium dynamics happening. What you see here is that, first of all, there are some atoms, you have energy conservation, some atoms are spilled out into the trap and after a characteristic time scale, which is actually the frequency of the trap, and this is a harmonic trap, are crashing back into the inner you know, part, which is that part. So you see that this is happening here, happening here. But apart from that, you have other oscillations, which you might see. You see there's an oscillation here taking place, yeah, which is a faster oscillation, uh, which is an inner breathing oscillation of the atom ion system. Yeah? And then these curves here, are the energies. So you see here, um, this is the trap energy, potential energy, which is smooth, but then this is uh, the uh, ionic binding or energy, atom ion interaction energy, or the corresponding kinetic energy, all together this is conserved. Of course, there's also the interaction, but which is not dominant over here. So what you have is, once you crash again, you have these oscillations here, which correspond to these amplitude oscillations here, and once it crashes back into the, uh, into the ion, you have heavy oscillations of these corresponding energetical parts. So you have periodic emission and back reflections of ions into the trap, and they're characteristic in the energy oscillations. And this is the same thing for longer time scales. See, this time scale was from 0 to 1. Now this is from 0 to 10. And you see that there's a decay and a revival, a decay and revival. And the, this is the ionic energy. Of the, and is the green one is the potential energy. The only thing in the potential energy you see, there's a very slight damping over time. Yeah. OK, this is a longer time period. So it goes from 0 to 6 as opposed from 0 to 1 again, and it is the density again. And you see these revivals, you see these oscillations here, and then they die out, you see here it is straight, and then they come back again here. Yeah. So again, this is the disappearance, disappearance and recurrence of ionic oscillations, but then with it, and this is the single particle density matrix, you see you're kind of nicely coherent here still, but you lose coherence over there, and you re-establish coherence at later times when the revival has been taking place. So, what we did then, having this analytic DHB, exact results, you want to understand more of it. You want to understand, in particular, for example, the fidelity. And what is the fidelity's spectrum? This is f of omega, the Fourier spectrum of the fidelity, uh, or, or autocorrelation function. And this is uh, done with a cluster expansion. So you develop a bosonic cluster expansion in singlet, uh, triplet, singlet, doublet, triplet, and so forth. And you anal analyze that. And you see this, the red one is the exact data Fourier transform from the propagation from MLMCDHP. And the blue circles are from the singlet dynamics, decoupled from the doublet dynamics, the contributions. And you see they match pretty well. Yeah? But on the other side, there's other peaks uh, which do not match, or in some sense, which are not present. Like, for example, this very well pronounced peak. Yeah. Actually, this peak is this kind of oscillation in the part, the atom ion oscillation part, yeah, which is the dominant contribution. Yeah. So now this part comes from the doublet dynamics. And then you can understand in detail how the emission into the trap goes and the back 
uh, reflection from the trap. And what all these contributions also in terms of coherencies are. Uh, so uh, in that sense, this analysis brings you really much deeper into the details of, of the physics and the processes taking place and gives you an idea, uh, indeed, uh, how variable the whole dynamics is. Okay, now this is just a glance, uh, to finish up with this part, this is just a brief glance that this is very correlated dynamics. It's not mean field theory. Yeah? So you see that here, this is the natural populations, this is an analysis in terms of natural orbitals. Uh, so that means any fragmentation process would mean uh, the natural occupation of the highest orbital is not one. And you see that immediately uh, after short time you just have a decrease. Then you should take care. This is a logarithmic scale. And then there's other orbitals coming up with a 10% probability mixing up and so forth. So you see this is a highly correlated process. And uh, uh, mean field theory may explain some of these things, but others uh, it completely fails. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now let me conclude with the final part. So far, I have not allowed the ion to move, okay? I have fixed it, it was a fixed potential. Now, this is a motional degree of freedom, which is on its track on its own, which should be also harmonic. And uh, I'm asking particularly for this crossover of this molecule ionization molecule in a bar thing. So what do I mean by this? Now, truly speaking, neutral atoms can bind into this kind of emotional system into this ion. And this is the two bound states over here, which we have uh, chosen properly, and then this is the continuum up there. So you could have bosons in the molecular binding, you could have dissociation or ionization from the uh, molecule, so there is some fraction being out, some fraction being bound, or you could have such a bound system in a bath of many molecules. So you see that system just from this aspect can be quite rich. And you can ask a number of questions, and that's actually what we have been addressing over here. How is that ion molecule formed? It is a kind of a mosaic quantum object. What is the phase diagram of such a phase diagram now? Phase diagram, a bit in quotation marks, of such a compound system. Um, th then what you can show is that there's stabilization by the cell, cell structure formation process. You can ask if they have such a quasi-particle or mesoscopic molecular ion, what is its dynamical response? How does the dissociation take, dissociation take place if I go into non-equilibrium? And uh, what is the interaction with the bath? And, and, and what, what happens with this quasi-particle? And what you see is that there's a strong self-localization of the ion. So all over you can, well, qualitatively, draw a phase diagram uh, in, in some sense. And that is characterized by number of particles and strength of interaction. Of course, if there's no interaction, you could load as many particles into your bound state as you want. But if interactions start to become important, and they are repulsive interactions, there's only a limiting number of atoms which you can feed into that bound states. And that varies a lot because you have two bound states, one with even parity, one with odd parity. So you could suck in some into the even parity, but then occupy the odd parity states, which are the uppermost uh, states close to threshold of the atom ion system. And so that's what you see. There, there's a, a kind of a phase boundary, if you're going to call it this way, uh, here for uh, chemical potential less than zero. You have an exclusively bound state, a mesoscopic molecular ion. If you're above, if you're mu larger than zero, you have this kind of dissociated system. There's a certain number of, of particles, neutrals, that are bound. And there's a soup of neutrals around this, which is in the trap. So the whole system is in a combined trap. So this is kind of the phase diagram, and of course some simple energetic consideration can give you an idea what the critical NCs are, what the critical GCs are. Okay, now if you want to look at that, of course, you should take a little bit of care of literature and, 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 and also take care of what is correlated, what is not correlated, and which approach uh, maybe can help you to understand the system. And then the first thing is, of course, mean field theory you could use. The second thing is the ansatz of cross. Uh, 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 historic uh, uh, seminar paperback, uh, and then what you see is taking the energy, now divided by the characteristic energy scale due to the polarization interaction, to energy as a function of particle number, you see exactly what I've been drawn over here, at a certain, at a certain particle number, the mu becomes positive, so your energy goes up. But what you see firstly here is that mean field lacks to describe this quantitatively, 
uh, and also the cross ansatz, which is much more uh, sophisticated, also uh, doesn't describe this, and, and that's the result of MLMs and DHP. <coughs> what you see is, first of all, the energies are significantly lower through the correlated approach, and also the minimum is somewhere else, which is for MLM CDD page here, here, and for mean field theory here. So the critical numbers are different, which come from the correlated versus the mean field approach here. Now let's have a look. I don't know how many minutes do I have left, actually. Zero. Zero. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, okay. Let me, let me very briefly. So you see how what happens here with increasing uh, uh, particle numbers, 5, 20, and then uh, you see that the ion, this is the ionic wave function, the density of the ion is trapped in between some rings of the atomic cloud. So that leads, therefore, to a self-localization. You can see that self-localization also in the atom ion correlation function, and not only in the density. You see that there's a characteristic peak of the bunching or, uh, of, uh, of the particles and of the ions correspondingly. So you, what you get is a self-localization process of the ion. This is because it gets more massive, the particle, and, and therefore it, it gets also more localized due to sorting in particles. Yeah. Um, and that, that, the second power state helps a lot to stabilize that, and, uh, and, and then you get essentially this kind of shell structure formation, which I don't have time to elaborate on here, unfortunately. Now, this self-localization is also seen if you compare the different approaches. If you look into the variance uh, very shortly here, this is uh, atomic variance are these curves here, and the, uh, the ionic variance are the red ones. And uh, the mean field theory is the one down here, which completely fails. The gross ansatz is above here. And the true physics is somewhere here in between. And then also the critical numbers are again shifted. You might want to see that as a, a mesoscopic molecule, molecule on the one hand side for low particle numbers and for larger particle numbers as something embedded into a bath. Or you would want to say it's a molecule under pressure. So uh, when you reach the scale of the system, the trap length. Okay, so this is my last slide, uh, and uh, this just shows you the, if you do an effective quasi-particle approach to this, now not through dynamical response, but how we did it, we simply calculated the force on this uh, molecular ion, and within the many-body wave function, we calculated the expectation value of that quantity, and then to tracing out all the other degrees of freedom, then we finally can obtain an effective omega star and an effective M star mark that specific hybrid uh, <coughs> particle has uh, as a response to the system. And then you can understand how this goes. With increasing N, this mass, uh, of course, gets larger and larger, but in the exact calculation, turns up to M at some point. And the omega star, the frequency response, is very much different from mean field, also from the cross approach. It is flat, meaning first no response, and then the response goes down, very slow response. And from here on, more or less, that you can see the quasi particle approach is not valid anymore. You shouldn't treat that system as a, a mesoscopic particle anymore. So that breaks down at this point. And uh, let me skip all of that. That's anyway short, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, in the last case, when you see that uh, the frequency goes to zero, would you see that the fidelity, if you would calculate it for that state, would go to zero, according to some, let's say, I mean, if there's no quasi particle, we would think that the fidelity goes to zero in the long time limit yes. uh, of your moving yeah, that, Did you calculate this? No, point? this is a structural property, this is not dynamic. Uh, sure, but like a single particle picture should break down and that would yeah, be yeah, the yeah, yeah. So What you would have to do then is make it dynamically because right. here's so a, like do yeah. a quench. Do a, yes, do a quench. Just open it. Yeah. Open the track a little bit and see what the response is. That we did not do. This was a structural analysis and we took here, as I said, this from this force. Yeah. Which is an alternative way of doing it. Yeah. Sure. Uh, from your experience, uh, how important that uh, at, uh, atomic mass should be much smaller than uh, ionic. From the, yeah, the that's first a good point. papers, they yeah. you know, emphasize on it, but yeah. I don't know, I'll yeah. see right. because you walk on this thing. Yes, yes. We, we have been choosing same masses essentially yeah, for these systems. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in, if, if one of them becomes 
very larger than the other one in the extreme limit. Well, of course, not mass infinity, but if, you, if the disparity is large, then you would, might be tempted to say that one species effectively creates a potential for the other species. Yes. Because it's heavy, you cannot take the feedback. That's our experience in that sense. But of course, making a factor of two, you're not in that limit. And that would be very interesting. One question. When you, this is one dimensional. This is one D simulation. Yes. So when you speak of um, downstate formation, yes. do you see the, either in frequency or in time evidence for things like dimer, trimer formation? Yeah, yeah. Or yeah, yeah. This is also sub summarizing everything here. And I have face that, but yeah. this means uh, there is here essentially uh, five particles are bound into the atom ion inner part. Let's, let's give you a pic yeah. picture yeah. In, yeah. Here, in here, into these bound states. Do you see in time, time uh, you know, in your dynamics, do you see signals for dimer, trimer, tetramer? Yeah, in an essence, time because. Is one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. If we didn't do dynamics with it. Huh. But, of course, this here, I'm sorry, this here, sorry for that. This here is dynamics, but this is not for a mobile ion, this is for a fixed ion. So now one should combine both. This is what you're saying. One should combine mobility yeah, of the ion with the non-equilibrium. And then you see what are the effects due to the motion of the ion, additionally on the taking the atoms, spilling them out again and so forth. I have a question on this uh, bound state. So eventually, the bound state will have very small distance between particles, like few angstrom. Um, <coughs> you have a, a molecular ion. Uh, no, no, this is, this, this is the last bound state. It has the scale which is uh, according to the uh, uh, length R star. R star is typically uh, 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. Right. Uh, yeah, that's the extension of the bound states would be around 100 nanometers which is essentially also widening with increasing neutral atom number if it fit into this. Right, but eventually you will have a chemically bound state. Yeah, yeah. but that would be a decay channel which is not included in here. Uh -huh. We do assume that this last bound state is populated, but there's no decay into inner bound states, yeah, yeah, right. which would be of the scale. Uh -huh. And of course, in order to check upon these rates, one should, to, should estimate them how large they are. Yeah. But that would be a decay channel for our system. Yeah, did you try to estimate how fast it goes into this chemical state? Mm -hmm. On the back of the envelope, yes, but not more carefully. So looking at frank quantum factors and, and, and checking out that this is really high scales on which you can observe the dynamics. Because the dynamics here in units here is something on the uh, many microseconds scale. No, it's not 10 milliseconds or so, it's also shorter. Yeah. Did you uh, <coughs> check for bosons and fermions and different statistics? What effect this has on these uh, dynamics and correlations? Now, I, 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 I... Yes, it's the P at the end. Oh, yes, the P at the end. It was the bosons. Thank you very much for this question, because we finished up... Uh, the X here, yeah, yeah. the MLMCDDHX, which is for bosons, fermions, and mixed of them. There's an X then there. That's a, that, you know, F and B, and should just go to the X immediately, <laughs> uh, in, instead of F and B. So um, yeah, we, we could do that, yes. We could do that, but we didn't do it yet. So in typical ion trap experiments, in the ground state of the ion as in the bird wave function has an extension of also ten, tens of nanometers or so. Yes. Does it play a role in your... Yes. What we did here is, and this now this refers to the last part, we chose actually something which is experimentally maybe not what an experimentalist would immediately do, in the sense that the ion trap had the same frequency uh, longitudinally and therefore confinement as the atoms. But we assured ourselves we can make a factor of ten of or more different, the same physics happens. Yeah. Of course, there's also other relevant things like micromotion, which is also not in here. Yeah. Heating, many open channels which uh, make a problem. Yeah. Any more questions? Join me in thanking Peter.